The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Grace in Focus from the Grace Evangelical Society. Today, we're going to answer a question or attempt to answer it. It's one that I know a lot of people have, and it is, can animals get everlasting life? Will we see our pets again? Will we see them in the kingdom? Will we see them in heaven? Well, stay tuned. I will be back after the content portion of the program. But let's get to that Q&A discussion right now with Bob Wilkin and Steve Elkins. Welcome to Grace in Focus. My name is Bob Wilkin. I'm here with... Steve Elkins. Well, thank you, Steve. And we have a question, uh, I believe, about pets in the kingdom, right? I I think it's a fascinating question. It's a person named Elise from a country far, far away. And she says, I would like to know if we will see our pets again after this life. I heard many people say that animals can't get everlasting life, therefore they won't be there with us when we're on the new earth. What do you think about it? Is there any evidence in the Bible for this? What do you think, Bob? Well, first, let's be absolutely clear. Animals cannot have everlasting life. They don't have it now, and they're never going to have it. That's number one. The only beings that can have everlasting life are the children of Adam and Eve humans. Christ didn't die for animals. Christ didn't die for angels, fallen or unfallen. And Christ only gives everlasting life to those whom he died for. So there'll be all kinds of angels in the kingdom, but they won't have everlasting life. Not a single angel has everlasting life. I'm talking about the unfallen angels. They don't have, what they have is an eternal relationship with God. Mm -hmm. That's what Adam and Eve could have had. Mm -hmm. If Adam and Eve had not sinned, they would have had a relationship with God, which eventually would have been fixed to where they couldn't sin. And it would have been an unending relationship, but they never would have had everlasting life. Interesting. But once they sinned, now they lacked everlasting life. And that mattered because now they were mortal and now they're going to die. If they went to the grave, never having believed then they were never going to have everlasting life. You know, John eleven twenty six. he who lives and believes in me shall never die. Well, once we die, mm-hmm. it becomes impossible to get everlasting life because right. it's only for those who live and believe in Jesus. And he's talking about the offspring of Adam and Eve. The result is animals may or may not be in the kingdom, even the specific animal that Elise is talking about. Maybe she's got, you know, Rudolph or something as a a cat or a dog. Maybe that specific animal would be in the kingdom, but whether it is or whether it isn't, the absence of everlasting life is not the issue. The issue is, is it God's will for animals to be in the kingdom? And then secondarily, is it his will that animals from this life will be brought back in the next. I had some wonderful dogs growing up and then with our family too. When we moved to Coppell and our kids were like high school age, we had this wonderful dog that had just showed up on our driveway years before, named him Patches. And Patches was just the most Christian dog that there could ever be. (laughs) What did you say? Uh, You said he was a Christian dog? If if there could be, because it was just the (laughs) sweetest puppy ever. Well, sadly, it got heartworms and uh, took him to the vet, and the vet said we needed to put her down. And I got to tell you, I cried more for that dog than my parents or relatives or anybody probably all combined. We had a counselor at our church back then. She's a psychiatrist. And I asked her, you know, why is this? And she said, Steve, you know, a lot of times we might have relations with our siblings or our parents or whatever. And so sometimes there can be some ambivalences because there's a history there. But we don't have that with our pets so often. Oftentimes, we project Christ-likeness onto them. Wow, that's and that, good. You know, that's a psychological thing on our part, but it was easy to do with this puppy. It was so sweet. Now, I have to admit, I sympathize very much with Elise. I might want to see her pet in the kingdom again. And, Bob, you would admit, even though animals don't have everlasting life, they potentially maybe could have this eternal relationship with God that you mentioned of that was yeah, possible for Adam. it's possible. It's possible. So in Romans 8, a passage I like to use to speculate that possibly animals or certainly animals are going to be in the kingdom, but whether our pets are going to be resurrected and be in the kingdom. In Romans 8, 19, it says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, not the children of God. We know who the children of God are already. That's whoever believes in Jesus. We know that. 
But the revealing of the sons of God refers to Hebrews 1, 9, and the enthronement day, the anointing of the metakoi, the companions who've been faithful to Christ to the end, who are going to get to rule with him forever and ever. And they are called the firstborn sons, capital F, capital S, who get the double portion of the inheritance. But these are sons, like in Hebrews 12, that have gone through the metakoi training program. And creation is waiting for the revelation of that. I've got more to say, but what do you think about that point? It is interesting that Paul says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And then he goes on and says, We also groan Hmm. as we eagerly are waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Right now, we already have redemption. We already have Christ dying for us. We've received the benefit of that by believing in him for everlasting life. We have the life that he gives, but we don't yet have our glorified bodies. And we groan anticipating that. This is the Greek word stenazo. It's a relatively rare word. It's also used in 2 Corinthians 5, 2 and 4, where Paul says we're groaning in these bodies as we await our better home, our better body that we're going to get from God. Same, the, same word that's used for stenosis, like if you have a narrowing of ah, your spinal column. Okay. Wow. So in any regard, yeah, I think it's no question in my mind, but that all of creation is groaning, including the animal world, the plant world, and even the rocks and the hills and the mountains. All of it is groaning. Now, the question I would have, and I'm somewhat a skeptic here, <laughs> Steve, that individual animals from this life are going to appear again in the kingdom. What I tend to understand that to mean is that there's going to be a renewed creation during the millennium and then a new creation on the new earth, which I tend to think is going to be a whole new set of animals and plants and rocks and hills and dirt and trees. But I'm open. Maybe God's going to bring patches back. Is that who it is? That's my puppy. Hey, Bob, I probably take the other view. I'm much less skeptical. I'm very hopeful that all creation is going to be there and even resurrected animals. For instance, it goes on to say, for the creation was subjected, that's all of it, every squirrel and bird and puppy, subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. I think they have hope. They're eagerly waiting for this day. They have feelings. And, Bob, the skepticism you have may be a, whether they're going to be there or not. If you didn't have this passage, you'd, wouldn't you be skeptical that creation is groaning? They're eagerly waiting. They're hoping for such a thing, the revelation of the sons of God? Yeah, I mean, I do see that that all of the creation wants this. There's a, a fantasy author named Dean Koontz. Mm-hmm. And he writes a bunch of interesting things. Some of them almost border on horror and things like that. But I like his writings. And in one of them, he has a dog that's a sentient being. And he's able to help this boy that's actually an angel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he can communicate. And when the dog is sleeping, it's dreaming about what Kuntz calls the presence with a capital P. And Kuntz says that all of the animal world knows of the presence. Wow. They know of the creator. They think about the creator. And of course, he, this dog is a sentient being, which I wonder if all the higher level mammals aren't sentient beings. They well, probably are. Bob, I personally believe on exactly that point that all creation is sentient in that regard. If they're eagerly waiting the revelation of the sons of God... Yeah. And, and they're having this hope. My goodness, they understand a lot more than most Christians. That's right. And keep in mind, it appears Adam and Eve were able to communicate with the animals in the garden because when the serpent starts talking, there's no big surprise. Right. And not only that, God has Adam name the animals and he names them based on getting to know them. Right. <laughs> and so it seems like he was able to communicate. Of course, remember Balaam's donkey's able to talk. Right. It says that God loosed her tongue. Yeah. Well, that suggests that donkeys and mules and horses and zebras could probably all talk today if God allowed them to talk. All right, I've got two questions for you. Oh, boy. You said we know with certainty that there will be animals in the kingdom. How do we know that? Well, that's easy. I mean, obviously in Isaiah, the lion will lay down with the lamb and put their hand into the adder's den and things like that. We also know from Ezekiel and other passages 
that there's a reinstitution of the sacrificial system without going on to a big elaborate theology of that. But you're talking the millennium here. Right, in the millennium, not forever, but in the millennium, there's a reinstitution of the sacrifices. And as far as the new earth, we don't have any direct statements in Revelation 21 and 22 about animals. So some right. people might speculate yeah. that means they're not there, but I tend to think they will be there in light of Genesis 1 through 3. Mm-hmm. In other words, the original creation had an animal world. If God intends to fulfill what he started, well, then we would expect to see the animals and the plants in the kingdom. Now, we do know there are plants on the new earth. We know right. there's going to be the tree of life, for example, that will be there. Yeah. And it's going to be not just one tree, but it's going to be like aspen. It's going to be like a whole yeah. grove of these things, right. but maybe one one organism. I compliment you on that because there are many uh, biblicists who do believe that the new heavens and new earth is a return to Eden, if you will, and the parallelism. Do you think that all of the organisms we have now will be on the new earth? For example, are we going to have viruses? Are we going to have bacteria that are harmful? Are are we going to have roaches? Mm -hmm. Are we going to have mosquitoes? I wonder if some of the organisms we have today were not brought about as a result of the fall. Well, what about like dinosaurs? You think we're going to get dinosaurs back in the kingdom? Well, there's some question about that. It's conceivable that dinosaurs were in the pre-created earth, but obviously that wouldn't be for the majority of our listeners. I think they, by and large, believe in a young earth. Right, and that there were actually dinosaurs on the ark. Then they would have died out because of the changes that took place across planet earth after the flood. Right, and obviously there's the Leviathan long after the flood and the animals that appear to be like dinosaurs. If my thinking's true in all creation, is going to end up being in heaven somehow or other. Yeah, to reply to the well, not source. heaven, but or the, the new earth. Thank yeah. you, or the new earth. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, very good. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening, and uh, keep grace in focus. Thank you, gentlemen, for that interesting discussion. Would you like to deepen your understanding of Scripture and the Christian life? Well, a great place to start is our website. It's faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. We've got all kinds of free materials on the site available for you. One of those which is extremely popular is our magazine, Grace in Focus. It comes out six times a year. It's full color, easy to read, and people are really growing who read it. So stop by and get a free subscription at faithalone.org. We would like to thank all of our financial partners who help us keep this show going. All gifts are tax deductible and very much appreciated. If you'd like to find out how you can be a financial partner, visit us at faithalone.org. We are so happy when we hear from listeners. Maybe you've got a question or comment or feedback. If so, please send us a message. Here's our email address. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. On the next edition of Grace in Focus, how can I be sure that my belief in Jesus is really in Jesus and not just in my belief in Jesus? Please join us on the next edition. This is the Grace Evangelical Society reminding you to always keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.